So I'm aware that people in this particular group, in this audience, people are practicing different practices from different traditions. And this is actually the first time I've given a talk in a Mahayana center, coming from this high Theravada forest tradition which is a uh, practice-based, meditation-based tradition with a fairly strict practice of the, the Bhikkhu Padimokha, the monk's rules. But uh, I also have attended His Holiness the Dalai Lama's teachings. Whenever he goes to Australia, I time my visits to see my parents with that. So I've attended His Holiness teachings in Australia, I think, uh, eight or nine times. And also attended his teachings in America twice and in India once. So I also listen up and take my notes. And so I'm, I have some familiarity with the, some of what you're studying and practicing and appreciation. In terms of similarities, rather than talk about the differences, I thought in terms of what is similar in all Buddhist traditions. If we look at the Dhammapada, these short verses, condensed teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, to do good, to avoid harm, and to purify the mind. This is the teachings of all Buddhas. And so I'm quite sure that the people here in Burkaya are people who are practicing kindness, compassion, generosity, service, and trying our best to avoid harmful acts as well. And then in terms of our Buddhist studies and our Buddhist practices, this is in the realm of training our minds, purifying our minds. So we're all engaging this to some extent in various ways. In the practice tradition, the forest practice tradition, we're practicing a lot of breath meditation and body awareness. We do walking meditation. We tend to do a lot of body contemplation, contemplation of death and impermanence. When we practice the four immeasurables, uh, it's more on the direct heart level. It's not so much visualization in the Theravada. It's more of a, what sometimes call what they call the feeling limiter, is you just establish the goodwill in your own heart as a feeling. One of the things I like to do when I teach metta meditation is to just ask people to acknowledge the fact of suffering and then to open the heart as a feeling, as a felt experience. So one of the things that Vajrayana does wonderfully is these very beautiful prayers and verses extolling the virtues of compassion and, and helping us to generate expansive mind states and beautiful attitudes. I think one of the things that Theravada does very well is keeping things simple and cutting really directly to some of the issues that we're, that we're working with or responding to. So this is another similarity, is that as human beings, as conscious sentient beings, we all have some experience of unsatisfactoriness. We all have some suffering in our minds, and our Buddhist practice is, I would assume, a response to that. How do we respond to the fact of suffering in a way which is skillful? In terms of purifying the mind, various methods of purifying the mind, one of the things I thought I'd like to emphasize today is the mindfulness practice, because I think Thay Theravada, that's a, a lifestyle, is largely to do with cultivating, generating, and trying to maintain consistently this body-based mindfulness. And that gives the mind the mental clarity and stability with which to perceive things directly according to their characteristics. So from what I've noticed from also studying Sambhadriyana is a lot of analytical meditation using logic. When the Western monks first started to turn up at Ajahn Chah's monastery in northeast Thailand, he would take their books away from them. And during the rainy season retreat, he would lock the library. 
and he wouldn't let anybody read anything. But he forced them to do a great deal of practice, and he told them to read their minds. And so there's different ways, and I suspect both ways are valid and both ways are good. And a large factor in whether or not we get good results from our practice is, I think, sincerity and consistency. That whatever practice we're doing, we do it with sincerity and we do it with consistency. I think that's really important. If you're having a good standard of sila, ethical virtue, you do a lot of meditation and you cultivate a lot of mindfulness, I'm very confident that you will start to see the characteristics of ultimate truth. So this is the, it's sometimes called Pachupana Dhamma, the here and now Dhamma, the present moment Dhamma. It's one of the things that can weigh heavily on our minds, I think, and be a cause for lacking in confidence, especially for you people who've made vows to be Buddhas, is this sense of it being so far away. The goal that you're aspiring to realize it seems such a long, long way away. But I think the truth is, if you practice correctly, you can have some direct experience here and now of some type of liberation. My teacher, Tanajana Nang, my main teacher in Thailand, talks about temporary liberations. Or in a way, I suppose, you often don't use the word liberation in Vajrayana, you use the word enlightenment. The Theravadans want to be liberated, the Vajrayanas want to be enlightened, <laughs> and then liberate everybody. <laughs> okay, one both very good. So, I think I really appreciate, one of the things I really appreciate about my main teacher in Thailand's emphasis is that if we practice consistently, we can experience, to some degree, liberation here and now. Liberation from what? So that's liberation from the five hindrances, hindrances that affect the mind and meditation. I'll talk a little bit more about those later. Or liberation from kilesa, klesha, I think you call them. So you have these three root kilesas, greed, hatred, and delusion. And so usually you come to the meditation cushion, there'll be some form of this in the mind, some form of craving, or some form of aversion, or some form of confusion, delusion, that's normal for unenlightened beings. If I'm going to be leading you in a breath meditation, if you find that you can consistently be with the feelings of the breath, so in the four foundations of mindfulness, practicing with physical feelings, if you can just be with the felt experience of an in-breath and an out-breath and train your mind to be with that experience and just be present in the body, if you can do it consistently enough, you'll find that the delusions fall away. Because what's occurring in the mind which has is affected by delusion is the mind's actually picking that up and grasping it. It's grasping with attachment and delusion, at a kilesa, at a hindrance. When you have samasati, right, mindfulness, one of the factors of the Eightfold Path, and you practice your right mindfulness consistently, then what occurs also is samasamati, right collectedness, right concentration. And when the mind has right mindfulness and right concentration, delusions, and uh, hindrances fall away from the mind, and you can experience a sense of clarity, a sense of spaciousness, a sense of radiance, a sense of well-being. And that is a temporary liberation, a small experience of enlightenment. And yes, the kilesa are still there latent in the mind, but it's good to take heart of our capacity to realize to some degree well-being, sanity, clarity, Peace. One of the things I want to do is just affirm that we all have this capacity. And I think one of our big challenges this day and age is distraction, restlessness, busyness. So this is very challenging to the practice of mindfulness because modern people we tend to think that multitasking is a good thing being able to do lots of things, accomplish lots of things, and maintain lots of friendships through social media and all of that, we tend to think that's good. More is better. In terms of 
trying to be mindful and peaceful, experience some form of clarity and some form of liberation from delusion, multitasking is terrible. It's a disaster. So, to the degree that you can, simplifying your life and practicing doing one thing at a time and being mindful of the thing that you're doing, this is a tremendous gift to your spiritual practice. And then another thing I want to suggest is in your spiritual practice, I know many of you do quite long, elaborate prayers and quite elaborate visualizations. One of the things I want to suggest to people who are really interested in experiencing some genuine peace in the present moment, in this life, is if you could do half an hour of breath meditation before the other prayers and before the visualization, so that when you come to do your prayers, and your visualizations, that you do it with a genuine sense of presence of mind and that you know what you're doing. And so with that little introduction, just for the last three weeks, just to mention, the last three weeks I've been doing an average of nine and a half hours of breath meditation every day at the Bodhi Tree. That's one of my, I've been an abbot for the last five years. One of the things I do to help put down my own sense of being busy, restless and distracted. Because of not just being an abbot, I've actually been supervising the building of the monastery from scratch. So there's a lot of details to attend to, a lot of people, a lot of just complicated issues, which is fine. You can't accomplish anything in this world which helps other people without hard work and complicated issues. That's just part of the samsaric predicament. <laughs> But then we do need to find ways to make our efforts sustainable for ourselves. And so one of the things I do is I usually come to Bokai in February for a whole month. And there is a part of the mind that wants to have a holiday and wants to have a rest. And this, as a spiritual practitioner, and for you guys, you bodhisattvas, as spiritual warriors, taking a rest isn't really an option. And... So what we have to do is we have to train ourselves to rest in our meditation. We have to rest within the container of heroic effort. So when I come to Bodhgaya, I try to sit between 9 and 10 hours a day. And I notice that the first week, it's really hard work actually. It's the pain in the body as the body gets used to that. Back in time, probably trying to do 4 or 5 hours a day. But in, in India, for this month, I try to do 9 or 10. What happens is, at about the two weeks point, it actually starts to feel genuinely regenerative, restorative, refreshing, restful. But it takes really, this is I suppose one of the things I wanted to emphasize, and some people might find it depressing, but I think it's just a fact, is that the results of meditation come from a great deal of effort and a great deal of discipline. And if you can maintain your efforts and your disciplines, then you'll find that you can rest, relax, be refreshed and be regenerated within the meditation, but only after you've established the discipline, which requires a certain amount of willfulness and determination and just making yourself do it. So a lot of, a lot of us don't like that. We don't like it. I think 20 years ago, nobody could have forced me to do 10 hours of meditation for a month. I would have just left. Forget that. That's too much force, too much control, too much authoritarianism, too much something. And now I find myself forcing myself to do it. And that's because I see a genuine benefit. And so doing it at the Bodhi Tree, I don't think... I think part of the reason that I can do it in Bokaya is because of the previous two decades of experience, I think most people would find a peaceful, quiet place. On one level, Bodhgaya is very peaceful, but it's not quiet. <laughs> As you all know. <laughs> but if you have some capacity to allow the mind to be spacious, and to try to hear sounds all around you without actually listening to any of them, and if you're willing to just wait then you'll find that the mind can become peaceful, and when it becomes peaceful, it becomes very peaceful. So one of the reasons I enjoy practicing Bukaya is that when the mind becomes peaceful here, it's more peaceful than it is for me 
in my monastery, which is on a mountain in a quiet part of Thailand, the mind actually becomes more peaceful here. That would have something to do with the, the blessings of this particular place. Enlightenment, vibration, possibly the devas. One of my teachers in Thailand said that at any one moment at the Bodhi tree, there's at least 10,000 devas circumambulating as well. 24 hours a day. And they're not just coming from this universe. There's, you get these so radiant beings from other universes also coming to circumambulate the Vajra Asana. But the mind needs to be sensitive and kind of porous and open enough through meditation to be able to get some intuition or some feeling of the rapture because devas experience rapture in their bodies. They have a more subtle body and they experience rapture a lot as part of their nature. They're enjoying the thoughts of their merit. And so I, my kind of intuition is that when the mind gets a little bit sensitive and peaceful, it has that stability, then you can almost empathically intuit the rapture of all of those radiant beings who are also circumambulating. So that's very joyful. But the point I was making is those kind of more blissful, spacious, lovely experiences are coming from the commitment to 10 hours a day. And it's coming up for a couple of weeks of that as momentum. So I'm not suggesting to, to all of you that you try to do 10 hours a day every day. But my, my point is, if we're consistent, and also to mention in Sutta, Lord Buddha did say that Anapanasati, breath meditation, he considered it the crown jewel in the crown of meditation methods. At the beginning of the Anapanasati Sutta, which Lord Buddha taught in Savati, he said that uh, by cultivating breath meditation, you can perfect the four foundations of mindfulness. In perfecting the four foundations of mindfulness, the mind merges in the deathless. That's the word he's using for Nibbana. So, another thing I'd like to talk about is faith. Drawing many points together here. Faith, one great master in Thailand, Lumpur Ha, mentioned that you need to have faith in four things to have success in your practice. One is the Buddha, then your teacher and his teachings or her teachings. Then your ability and also the, the place where you are. So you need to have this faith in the Buddha, faith in what he taught, faith that where you are is good enough. And then your own ability. So this last one, I think a lot of people have doubts. And whatever doubts you have with regards to your own ability, I recommend that you challenge your doubts because that's one of the five hindrances. And you need to see a doubt as a doubt. You don't want to believe your doubts. And we all just need to affirm that human beings with consciousness have as an innate potential capacity to develop the mind, purify the mind. Another great master in Thailand my preceptor, he says, purity is born from delusion. His point is the very space where the delusion is, is the space where the insight, the illumination, the liberation occurs. So without ignorance and delusion, you don't have liberation from ignorance and delusion. So you, one should never look at ignorance and delusion and see that as something that you can't work with, see that as hopeless, see that as a reason to reject your practice. One looks at that and sees, okay, this is where the potential of transformation is. And you have to be really confident. Because there is delusion, there is freedom from delusion. Because there is non-enlightenment, there's the capacity to be enlightened. And to think that you, just one being among billions of beings, are the only one who doesn't have the capacity to be Enlightened is completely deluded. So you have to challenge that delusion and say, no, me too. And uh, when you make your prayers, may all beings be free from suffering, you should also never forget that you are one of those beings. Because a lot of people, a lot of modern people have this withholding of the metta from themselves. This sense of wanting to benefit all beings, but not liking yourself very much. This also needs to be challenged. 
So in terms of faith in your abilities, faith in your capacity, and then also nourishing your efforts with confidence, and then giving yourself some of that metta that you're cultivating for so many beings. And then that has to translate into a commitment to daily practice. And what I wanted to emphasize was the mindfulness of physical feelings, knowing one in-breath is an in-breath, knowing the physical feelings, so that's the beginning of the breath, the middle of the breath, the end of the breath. In the beginning, we train in knowing from the nose, down through the chest, into the abdomen. Just knowing the feelings. So something that I think is going to be a challenge for people who practice a lot of Vajrayana is to not visualize anything, because there's so much visualization. So no visualizing. Just trying to know the felt experience exactly as it is. Mindfully aware of a feeling as a feeling. And then the out-breath, abdomen, chest, nose, and you just try to know those feelings. After about five or ten minutes, if you find that you can feel those feelings more clearly, either in the nose, or in the chest, or in the abdomen, you know the beginning, the middle, and the end of the in-breath just in that one place. So more localized. But at the beginning, five to ten minutes, try to know the whole physical breath and breathe as deeply a few times. Just And then... Afterwards, you can choose. Are you going to watch it just in the nose area or in just in the chest area or just in the abdomen area? Or you can continue to know it the whole in-breath and the whole out-breath. What will happen for a lot of people is that there will be thoughts and thoughts about the past, thoughts about the future, thoughts about other people. And so this is where what Lord Buddha was saying in the Anapanasati Sutta that in practicing breath meditation, you can actually develop all the four foundations of mindfulness, this is why it's such a precious jewel, is that just in being, trying to be mindful of the breath, you become mindful of a thought. And so you don't have to change the thought, you don't have to destroy the thought, you don't have to think about the thought. What you have to do is know a thought as a thought. So this is, mindfulness is something which is very poorly understood. And... One of the things I think that the Thai forest tradition can give to the Buddhist world is to help people understand mindfulness a bit better. It's not a concept. So we all have, most of the time, a kind of a fuzzy mindfulness, a basic awareness of what you're doing with your body. Good mindfulness knows that the body's a body. It's not thinking it's too old, it's too fat, it's aging too quickly, none of that. It just knows a physical body is a physical body. And then it knows the position that the body is in. With mindfulness, you know that you're sitting. You know that you're getting up. You know when you're walking. You know when you're walking through a door. It's the present moment recognition of what the body's doing. Then with feelings, it knows a pleasant or a neutral or an unpleasant feeling. And if mindfulness is really good, it knows the beginning, the middle, and the end of the feeling, the arising and the cessation of the feeling. So training with this... Training and just being mindful of the body as a body, just being mindful of feelings as feelings. All of that stuff that we do with the mind is just so exhausting. You just drop it, don't pick it up, and you'll find that the mind gets re-energized because it's able to collect into itself by maintaining right mindfulness. What occurs is right collectedness or right concentration. And you'll find that things which darken the mind fall away and the mind's innate radiance rejuvenates. But another thing to be wary of is not to lose heart when the thoughts come. You have a busy life, and you have to answer a lot of emails, answer a lot of text messages, answer a lot of phone calls. There's no way you can not have thoughts in your meditation, unless you're very skilled at meditation. And if you're skilled at developing those skills, what you have to be able to do is to see the thought as a thought. So it's just like stepping back from it. Not picking it up. Not, so what you can do is not follow on with the thought. So the thought comes in. Okay, recognize the thought as a thought. Try not to follow it. And notice when it ceases. It's very helpful because we suffer so much through identification with our thoughts. And uh, one, one thing that Patriana does a lot of is, I think, what they call replacement through opposites, is where you pick up the positive thoughts, the very altruistic thoughts, and you keep hammering in these beautiful thoughts about benefiting beings. Very helpful for keeping the mind wholesome. 
But in terms of experiencing serenity and peace, being able to see a thought as a thought without identifying with it at all, and just being aware of it as it arises and ceases, that's peaceful. That's a very peaceful experience. And then in terms of then later on being able to recognize delusion is delusion and not believing it. So these little moments when you can see a thought as a thought without believing it, very, very helpful. Because when the delusions come in, you're able to separate from them. It's not me, not mine, not I. It's just delusion. You don't have to believe it. You don't identify with it. The less you identify with those delusions, the weaker they get. So when delusions come up in the mind, if you grasp at them, and if you think that's you, I'm deluded, I'm unenlightened, that's feeding the delusion. It's making karma with it. You see a thought as a thought, you see delusion as delusion, and to the extent that you can, you just pull back from it and you don't pick it up. That delusion is going to slowly starve and die. So it seems sitting and trying to see thoughts as thoughts doesn't seem very sophisticated, doesn't seem very sexy, doesn't seem very profound. And you can sit there thinking, what's the point? But there's a great deal of benefit, because every time you can just see a thought as a thought, you're establishing this, what, will, what is ordinary mindfulness becomes mahasati. Mahasati, combined with samadhi and wisdom, destroys delusion. So it's immensely valuable. So we have to practice a lot of patience, and you have to have confidence. Okay, the Buddha said, Anapana Sati, breath meditation is the crown jewel of the meditations. Uh, right mindfulness is one of the factors of the Eightfold Paths, conditions the arising of right concentration. So we have to embrace it with faith and confidence in the value of it. And then you have to be patient with another thought, another thought, another thought. But there is a difference between being aware of thoughts, even if there's a lot of thoughts, and actually picking them up and thinking them and not being mindful of them at all. It seems, it's a subtle thing, but there's an enormous difference because that which knows that we want to develop to be more and more profound, that which knows feelings as feelings, thoughts as thoughts, that's being cultivated. And this, the way my teachers have explained it, when that which knows these things clearly as they are in the present moment, moment to moment, gets stronger and stronger, that's what destroys ignorance and delusion. So it's very valuable. In terms of the four foundations of mindfulness, becoming mindful of your breath in the chest area. One in breath, one out breath. And then you'll notice these thoughts come up. Why did she say that? It's not fair. She shouldn't have said that. I try so hard to be reasonable and fair, and what she said was totally unreasonable, totally unfair. Okay, thoughts as thoughts. Come back to the breath. And then you with the breath for a few more times. Says, no, no, really, what she said was really wrong. She shouldn't have said it. She was really wrong. Okay, again, what I want to point to here is in trying to be aware of a breath as a breath, if the mindfulness is good, you can then become aware of a mind state as a mind state. You see? Just when it's trying to be aware of the in-breath and the out-breath, it's like breathing in. She shouldn't have said that. She shouldn't have said that. Breathing out. And, and what you can do is just be aware of the feeling of that as well. Now, when you learn how to train with mindfulness, there's a feeling there. There's a mind state there. And there's the breath awareness there, and there's a body there. And they're all there at the same time, in the same space. And if you can just be, come back to the breath, try not to identify with that thought, in, breathing out. Forgive her, forgive her, it's your karma, it's your karma. Okay, I'll forgive her. <laughs> but <laughs> you do, you have to do this, don't you? you have to talk to yourself. Training your mind, purifying the mind. And then you can see then the thoughts might drop away. Okay, you're going to forgive her. Or him. Breathing in, breathing out. But the feeling lingers. So there you have your mindfulness of a mind state, which has a mental feeling that's occurring in that heart area. Breathing in, breathing out. And it might take 5, 10, or 15, or 20 minutes, and that feeling dissolves and falls away. And if you're being diligent with your mindfulness meditation, you can see the end of the in-breath, the end of the out-breath, the cessation of the thoughts, 
lingering of the feeling, and you can use that breath to ventilate that mental feeling. Breathe around it, breathe through it. Your breath energy can actually dissolve it. And then you can notice that falls away. So you can notice that it changes. You get these hot, hard feelings. Dissolves, relaxes. At a certain point, there's a cessation of that mind state. And then there's just the breath. Awareness of the in-breath, awareness of the out-breath. And at that point, things start to be really spacious and really peaceful. What's the mind like when it's not picking up a mind state? It's not upset or infatuated or craving. And you can experience the, the latent, pleasant feelings in your mind if it isn't affected by hindrances. There's some collectiveness. There's a lot of rapture, a lot of tranquility arise in the mind. These factors of jhana. If you, you train yourself in your meditation. But right there, the incredible potential for developing mindfulness, concentration, and insight. Because when that mind state ceases, and if you're really paying attention and you've got some clarity there, you can see impermanence of a mind state, not self. And what you experience, something that you're already interested in, is emptiness. You experience emptiness right there. Sense of self falls away. No me, no mine, no I, no them. No one upset, no one to be upset with. You see? But that's experience there, with your eyes closed, with your mindfulness of your breathing. But this kind of result requires consistency. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the benefits of your breath meditation if you if you cultivate it. And then the other benefit, of course, is when you pick up these beautiful prayers these beautiful visualizations. If you can do them with a sense of presence of mind and a sense of collectiveness, and you really bring your mindfulness and concentration to your bodhicitta aspiration or to your visualization, then obviously you're going to have a lot more good, clear energy to, to bring to those prayers and to those visualizations. So shall we do some breath meditation? The following is a guided meditation that was offered to the group of people that listen to this talk at Root Institute, Bhagaya. It covers a basic description of breath meditation methods leading on to loving-kindness meditation. There are also some encouragements and advice about how to persist with these methods in order to get good results. If you have time now, you might consider continuing on with the meditation. It goes for one hour. If you don't have time now, please consider coming back later to refresh your understanding if you think that might be helpful. Make yourself as comfortable as you can. We're going to use some noting methods. When we do the breath meditation for the first five minutes, I'm going to suggest that you note one, two, and three. One at the nose, two at the chest, three at the abdomen. And then on the out breath that you note three, two, and one. Three at the abdomen, two at the chest, one at the nose. Just mentioning again, trying to be aware of a feeling as a feeling. No visualization, no controlling. And if you find yourself trying to control, that's normal too. And what you do is you're just aware of that and you try to relax that in the mind, which is trying to control. And if you can't, that's okay too, but just be aware of that intending to relax it. So first of all, one in breath, eyes closed. Just trying to feel the feeling. At the nose, as the breath comes in, note one, mentally, quietly. As it passes through the chest, note two. As it passes through the abdomen, note three. As it leaves, three, two, one. At your own pace, natural breath. Breathing in, one, two, three. Breathing out, three, two, one. Do that for the 
next five minutes. With sounds, you just try to be aware of sounds without actually listening. Sometimes people note hearing, hearing. Intending to be aware of the feeling, so placing your attention on the physical feeling. Knowing, trying to know an entire in breath. Nose, chest, abdomen, one, two, three. Abdomen, chest, nose, three, two, one. And you just use the counting as a way of restraining the thinking mind and as a way of being with your meditation object. The meditation object here is the feeling of the breath. Breathing in. So we have those feelings, the beginning, middle and end of an in-breath, nose, chest, abdomen, beginning, middle, end of an out-breath, abdomen, chest, nose, one, two, three, three, two, one. using the breath meditation to be more fully mindful in the present moment. That means not picking up thoughts about the past, not sending the mind into the future, not sending it out, Just allowing the mind to rest in the parameters of the physical body, aware of the feelings, physical feelings of the breath, nose, chest, abdomen, abdomen, chest, nose, Using that noting just to help you to be with the breath. One, two, three. Three, two, one. Also use the breath in a way, bringing in fresh energy, establishing clarity of mind, presence of mind, and with the out breath in particular, putting things down, releasing, 
letting go. So whatever the various mind states are, the thoughts and breathing out, you can try to just put them down. You don't need them now, no need to hang on to them, allowing the mind to rest. Breathing in, establishing clarity of awareness, presence of mind that knows a feeling as a feeling. Breathing out, putting down the thoughts, putting down the past, allowing it to be where it is, gone, the past. Breathing in, one, two, three. Breathing out, three, two, one. Change the mental noting now. Still being aware of the feeling, the nose, chest, abdomen, but on the in breath, just noting one. Aware of the feelings, abdomen, chest, nose, out breath, noting one. We do this up to five. Next in breath, two. Next out breath, two. Three. Three. Up to number five. And then after the fifth one, once again, breathing in five, breathing out five, back down to one. We're using this mental loading just to help us to be with the feeling of the breath and restraining the mind gently from wandering. One of the wonderful things about counting the breath, many times we want something profound, something sacred, something auspicious, amazing mantra. But one of the really wonderful things about counting the breath is that as soon as you lose your mindfulness, you don't know what number you're up to. You forgot what number, and that's a great way of knowing that you let the mindfulness go. So the point isn't the numbers, the point is the quality of presence of mind and the numbers are helping you to keep the mindfulness in the body and to really be with the breath, so counting the breaths. One in breath, one in breath, one. One out breath, one. to five, and the in breath five, the out breath five, and then you go back the other way, back down to one. And then start over again.
it's a very effective method to use at the beginning of meditation to help the mind to become a little more present, a little more collected. And try not to get upset if you lose track of the number, it doesn't matter. Just start again. Establishing that present moment awareness of the feelings of the breaths. One, one, we just start again. Still trying to be aware of the beginning, middle and end of an in-breath, or the entire in-breath, the feelings involved, and then knowing the feelings of the out-breath, coming into the body, leaving the body, and using the noting method to help you to be mindful and to help restrain the mind from thinking about other things. Trying to be aware of the breathing when it comes to the various noises that can impinge on consciousness. And try not to let them impinge. It's just awareness. So when there's a feeling of impingement, the sense of self that's listening, liking, not liking. And so when we picking up the breath meditation, trying to pull all of that down. Aware of a feeling as a feeling, and then just aware of sounds, aware of hearing. And it's possible for the mind to become more and more spacious and to be able to hear all of these sounds without clinging, just aware of sounds in space, arising and ceasing. Placing our attention upon the physical feeling of each in-breath, the physical feelings of each out-breath, using this as our skillful means to generate clarity of mind, putting down deluded thoughts, putting down the past, not picking up the future, not picking up perceptions of others, not picking up perceptions of oneself, thoughts about yourself. Just aware of physical feeling, that's the basis of this meditation. And then upon that basis then, whatever thoughts come up, just seeing a thought as a thought, and whatever mental feelings there are in the heart area, aware of them, but not making anything out of them using the breath to ventilate and on the out breath putting things down bringing a sense of present moment clarity into the body and mind experience using the breath generating mindfulness on the in breath and putting things down on the out breath and hopefully as the meditation progresses there's a sense that one can relax into the awareness Things become more relaxed and more pleasant. At first we have to force yourself a little bit, pay attention to those feelings. Don't let the mind wander after some time, just resting with the awareness of breath.
once again, we're going to change the mental noting method now. In Thailand, we use the word Buddha, synonym for Buddha, and with all these wonderful connotations. So breathing in Bud, breathing out Do. If there is still quite a bit of thinking, breathing in Buddha, breathing out Buddha. Thailand, they translate the meaning of this word. It's a kind of a mantra. As knowing, wakeful, radiant. So this mindfulness, radiant, present, moment, clear quality. The Buddha was the one who knew things as they truly were, as they truly are, awakened, radiant. So this is a word with the most wonderful positive connotations. Picking up that word, breathing in good, breathing out dumb. Affirming the capacity to be awake, aware, clear, bright. But not adding anything to the experience of the breath, not visualizing anything, not doing anything other than being aware and allowing other things to fall away. Just knowing a feeling as a feeling. And as the mindfulness gets more clear, you can know more subtle feelings. The breath coming in the nose is a little cooler than the breath that leaves the nose. You know the feelings with more nuance. You pay attention more carefully. You bring a quality of care. Be interested in this breath. Knowing those feelings. Breathing in boot. Breathing out down. Aware of physical feelings, aware of one in breath, aware of one out breath. We also train keeping that awareness within the body, so you're also aware of the spaces between the breaths. Breathing in, knowing the feelings, nose, chest, abdomen, and then there's a space. Keeping that presence of mind in the body, breathing out, abdomen, chest, nose, knowing those feelings, and then there's a space. And even in that space, just having that presence of mind.
knowing the beginning, the middle and the end of each in-breath, each out-breath, and even the spaces in between, holding that clear awareness in the present moment, in the physical body. Breathing in foot, breathing out dough. Five more minutes we'll be doing some loving kindness meditation. I'd just like to encourage you now to really try and establish that present moment clarity. And really being in the body. Arjun Samedo often says a lot of what we have to practice with in meditation is boredom. It's really important to be willing to practice with the ordinary boring mind because before your meditation deepens you have to be willing to just be still and a lot of what you have to be still with is tedious boring but if you don't learn how to be with that with some quality of contentment when these compulsive energies come up in the mind that want to go on to the next thing on to the next thing on to the next thing it's just endlessly running around in samsara. It never ends. And it never deepens. So you have to be willing to be with the boring mind, with its tedious thoughts and the same mind states that you don't want to see again, but there they are. This is really a large part of practice. And being willing to be with this with patience, with contentment, what you'll find is that that same boring, tedious mind state that you don't want to be with, if you just stay still, falls away. And then you experience the bliss of a clear, radiant mind. But you have to be willing to be with it until it ceases. Otherwise, come back to your meditation and it's going to be the same boring, tedious mind states that you never get to see through have to be willing to practice with the boringness, you have to be willing to practice with the restlessness, you have to be willing to practice with the drowsiness. These are these five hindrances. I'll just go through those. A lot of what comes up in your meditation is the five hindrances. Theravada is wonderful in its short, pithy, helpful lists. Sensual craving, the pleasant thing you'd rather be having rather than just being with the breath. Or aversion, the things you want to get rid of. That's the second hindrance. Craving for, craving not for. So 
to understand that you have to see that clearly, not pick it up, allow it to cease. And then the mind becomes peaceful. If you get up and you go and chase for the craving, or chase away the craving, you're just making more karma. The mind will become peaceful. So that's first two, craving for, craving not for. The third one, sloth and torpor, so sleepiness and dullness. A lot of the problem of modern people is because we are busy, we are restless, we are distracted, we come to meditate, the mind is genuinely tired. And so you find it falls asleep. I recommend to my students that they meditate in the morning before they get busy, before checking their phones, turn the phone off, don't check the computer. Meditate in the morning when the mind's already rested, establish the clarity at the beginning of the day. The most important thing is your spiritual practice, so do it first, not last. Establish that clarity and bring that clarity into your day. With sleepiness and dullness, just bringing awareness to know it. You might think, oh, the mind's too sleepy, I'm not going to meditate, I'll get up. No. Whatever's in the mind, that's what you be mindful of. And you use the breath, breathe a little more deeply, breathing in, put, breathing out, don't. Use the breath to wake the mind up. Try to be aware of those feelings, breathe a bit more deeply if you can. In generating awareness, the mind becomes awakened. Dullness and sleepiness falls away from the mind when the mind wakes up. It wakes up by having right mindfulness, right collectedness. It becomes radiant, clear and awake, right in that very space where the dullness and the sleepiness was. Brilliant clarity can arise, but only if you maintain the mindfulness to the point of seeing the cessation of that hindrance. hindrance, restlessness. So the mind running around, that's the other thing. If you keep running around, allow your mind to keep running around, when you come to meditate, the mind's going to be running around. And it's only through staying with it until it stills. Ajahn Chah gives a wonderful analogy. In northeast Thailand, you have these little chicken coops. They're made out of rattan. And you place your chicken under it. And the chicken runs around and runs around and runs around, and at a certain point it sits down by itself. It says meditation is like that. If you try to hold the chicken down, the chicken gets very agitated, and it will get away. But if you place this little coop over it, it runs around, it runs around, it scratches, it picks, and at a certain point it sits down. So meditation is like that. You have to be with the chicken in the mind until it sits down by itself after scratching and pecking. See the nature of restlessness, it ceases. But when the restlessness ceases, clarity, serenity, peacefulness. Fifth one, doubt. 
So this can be all sorts of things about your own abilities, about the Buddha's teachings, about this meditation method. You have to see doubt as doubt and be aware of that and don't believe it. Doubt for doubt. can be very insidious, can undermine your confidence, can take you away from the practice if you don't see it for what it is. It's a hindrance. The Buddha describes these five things as robbers, bandits. They steal the peacefulness from the mind. You have to know them. They have to be apprehended with mindfulness. See them as they are. A hindrance is a hindrance. When you become mindful of it as a hindrance and you maintain your awareness on your meditation object, the hindrance ceases of its own nature. Then you're just aware of the feelings, your mind can be very peaceful and calm. So getting to know those five hindrances, getting better at recognizing them quickly, putting them down quickly, Having confidence in the meditation method, confidence in your ability, and just doing it with some consistency. Still aware of the feelings of the in-breath, feelings of the out-breath. Not picking up hindrances. Trying to be content with whatever amount of clarity, whatever amount of peacefulness there is, it's okay. It's good enough. I'm going to move into some loving-kindness meditation now. We're all familiar with the various types of delusions that frequent our minds and types of suffering, mental suffering that that can give rise to. And so I just ask you now, at this point in your life, and do you still have suffering? And then just considering where it is that the suffering of our life is actually experienced. And I think we'll find that the suffering of our life is experienced in this heart area, in the mind, So, bringing some tender awareness into the heart area. And just aware of the fact that there is still some suffering. This is, I believe, a very important step in meta cultivation. Acknowledging the suffering of the unenlightened saint, just being aware of it, acknowledging it, no judgment at all, and no pushing away, just a tender awareness 
and then we try to respond to that skillfully. And just as you would try to respond to a friend suffering with compassion, with kindness, just listening perhaps, someone's talking about a painful experience, listen, give ear, empathy, and just hear them, they might find that very helpful. And then you might offer some advice if it's wanted, if it's helpful to that person, but this stage of just being aware of and listening with empathy. So we offer this to ourselves, aware of the various ways that we suffer. We're trying to have some tender regard, and in a way, even respect. I like to encourage people to have respect for their suffering. Why would you respect suffering? You respect it because it's a very powerful phenomenon. And if you just hate suffering, it's actually not a very workable situation. So you're aware of the suffering and you just hate it. The mind will be very bright in that experience. But when you're aware of suffering and you have some kind of an appreciation, even awe, oh, wow, this is an amazing phenomenon, impressive, this suffering thing, wow. Then opening the heart in response to the suffering, recognizing that it isn't always there, it's not your ultimate nature, mind states coming in, coming out, some of the very painful. Recognizing that there's another potential. We wish ourselves, may I be well, may I be happy. Breathing in, may I be well. Breathing out, may I be happy. very important to just allow the suffering to be as it is first. It's like listening to your friend first before clobbering them over the head with the advice. Listen, hear, feel the suffering. Okay, that's a valid experience. Allow some spacious awareness around it. And then sincerely wish that the mind can be free from this, without pushing it away, without hating it, without wanting to destroy it. Just this beautiful wish, may I be well, may I be happy. Breathing in, we use this breath energy, establish this mindfulness now, this beautiful breath energy coming through the heart area, chest area, now we can use this. Breathing in, may I be well. Breathing out, may I be happy. And so as you breathe in, allow the warmth of loving kindness to arise in the heart area. Even in that same space where there's suffering, you can allow some warmth to come into that experience. Sometimes you can surround the feeling of suffering with a different feeling. A beautiful metta, citta, pure intentions, sometimes called loving friendliness, sometimes called unconditional love. So what I was trying to emphasize is when we allow the suffering just to be as it is, there's a quality of loving acceptance. Breathing in, I allow this experience, whatever it is, I accept it as it is. Breathing out, may I be well, may I be happy. Breathing in, allowing the mind to be as it is, just as it is in the present moment. At the same time, engaging the mind's dynamic capacity to generate something else. 
and not coming from aversion. Coming from metta chitta, heart of loving kindness. Breathing in, we have you well, allowing some warmth to arise in the heart area. Breathing out, we have you happy. And you allow that warmth to spread through the chest area, suffuse the upper body with this felt experience of the mind state of loving kindness, breathing in may I be well, the warmth of loving kindness arising in the heart area. Breathing out may I be happy, allowing that warmth to spread through the chest, loving acceptance, and then also generating the goodwill, unconditional love, and then loving friendliness, loving kindness, Breathing in, may I be well. Breathing out, may I be happy if you can. Allow the feeling of metta to fill the entire upper body. On the in breath, you generate it right there in the core of your being. May I be well. Love, unconditional love. And breathing out, may I be happy, then allowing it to spread radiating out from the heart area, encompassing the upper body. Breathing in may be well, breathing out may be happy. Do that for another minute or so, and then I'll encourage you to bring to mind someone else to radiate loving kindness towards as well. It's very important to establish it for this being, one among all beings, before you try to radiate it to all beings. If there is a kind of a latent habit of withholding the metta to oneself, it won't actually be able to become very expansive and very radiant because it has to radiate from this being. So wholeheartedly feel this being with loving kindness so that you can radiate it to all beings. Don't withhold any metta from yourself. Totally saturate and bathe the mind in this energy so that you have it as a resource to share. Breathing in, may I be well. Filling the heart with loving kindness. Breathing out, radiating that warmth of loving acceptance, loving friendliness, goodwill, all throughout your own body. to bring to mind somebody who you find it easy to have feelings of loving kindness and appreciation for. It might be a teacher, a friend, breathing in, may I be well, and breathing out, visualize this person in front of you smiling and breathing out, may that person be well, you can say their name. Breathing in, may I be well and happy, breathing out, may this person, my friend, my teacher, be well, be happy. So on the in-breath, regenerating, replenishing that loving kindness with your beautiful, pure intentions. And then breathing out and radiating it outwards. Start with being that it's easy to have loving kindness for. Breathing in, may I be well, may I be happy. Breathing out, may this other person who may also have some suffering, may they be well, may they be happy.
I'd like you to bring to mind now one or two other people that you find it easy to have metaphor. You see these two or three people in front of you smiling and breathing in, may I be well, may I be happy. Generating loving kindness in the chest area. Breathing out, may these people, my friends, my teachers, my relatives, may they be well, may they be happy, then radiating that loving kindness. You don't have to think about where they are, you don't have to try to send the mind all the way around the other side of the world. Just see them in front of you and see them smiling and just trust that that capacity of the mind and blessings will reach them from where you are. Breathing in, may I be well, may I be happy. Breathing out, may these people be well, may they be happy. And just coming back to the experience of oneself. Breathing in, may I be well. Breathing out, may I be happy. Breathing in, may I be well. Breathing out, may I be happy. And now I'm going to ask you to bring to mind somebody that you feel neutral feelings towards. So somebody that you know that you don't particularly feel that you like or don't like. You might pass them on the street each day. Somebody in the shop. Somebody you know here, you don't know very well, just feel neutral towards. Breathing in, very well. Allow a loving kindness to be regenerated in mind. Breathing out, may this person, this neutral person, be well, be happy. We're training the mind to have a capacity to have loving kindness towards larger numbers of beings. First for the people that it's easy, and then the neutral people, of which the numbers are huge. Breathing in, may I be well. Breathing out, may this neutral person be well, may they be happy. And just understanding as you wish to be free from suffering, as you wish to realize your ultimate potential, other people also don't want to suffer, want to be happy. Many people pursuing happiness in deluded ways, which will result in greater suffering, unfortunately. But we wish them well. May they meet with the causes that lead them to end their suffering, to be free from suffering. So when we wish people, we have to empower those words with meaning. What does it mean to be well? To be well, free from delusion, to have good teachers, to have good opportunities, and to be able to use those opportunities. And in a way, that's what we 
they're wishing for people to be truly well. May they meet these wisdom teachings, meet wise beings, meet teachers, meet opportunities to practice, train their minds. May they have similar good fortune. Breathing in may I be well. Breathing out may this neutral person be well. Breathing in may I be happy. Breathing out may this neutral person be happy. And if you can, try to bring to mind one or two other neutral people. Seeing them in front of you, smiling. Breathing in and as you wish yourself well. You also wish these other people well. As you wish to be happy, you wish these people have happiness in the causes of happiness. Breathing in, generating it in one's own body and mind. Breathing out, radiating it towards other people's bodies and minds. Breathing in, may I be well, may I be happy. Breathing out, may these other neutral people be well, be happy. The last few minutes of the meditation now. I'm going to take a bit of a leap. Breathing in, may I be well. And breathing out, may all beings be well. Breathing in, may I be happy. Breathing out, may all beings be happy. again, trying to emphasize this direct to the heart, direct from the heart, direct to the mind, direct from the mind felt experience. Breathing in may I be well. Breathing out may all beings be well. discriminating, so allowing this loving-kindness energy to flow out in all directions, above, below, around, everywhere. Breathing in, may I be well, may I be happy. Breathing out, may all beings be well, may all beings be happy. Breathing in, may I be well, may I be happy. The warmth of loving kindness in your own heart area. Breathing out, may 
all beings be well, may all beings be happy, may all beings have the causes of happiness. Breathing in, may I be well, may I be happy. Breathing out, may all beings be well, may all beings be happy. Once again, just coming back to the perception of yourself, of this mind and body. Breathing in, may I be well. Breathing out, may I be happy. things I like to get people to do at the end of a meditation session, now that the mind is a little more sensitive and receptive, to so make some kind of a commitment to yourself that I will take care of my mind, my life a little more. Understanding that if I aspire to be well and to be happy, I have to maintain ethical standards, take care of your precepts, to be consistent in your practice, your spiritual practices. As we do tend to get busy and distracted, so after the meditation session, understanding that if I am to experience greater peace and happiness and help others, I need to take care of my life, make some kind of a commitment motivated by loving kindness for myself and others. I commit to being more consistent in my spiritual practices, being a little less distracted. Try to start your day with your spiritual practice, not leave it to the end of the day. Set some kind of motivation, aspiration to actually lay the causes for happiness in yourself. That will allow you to share that happiness with more beings. And then lastly, dedicating the merit. So dedicate that however you wish to. 
That could be to specific people you know who might have suffering, might need some good energy, or it might be to all beings, it might be to your teachers, as you see fit. Again, just in the mind, just from a deep space in your heart, once it's calm and peaceful, full of love, then you just share that, bring to mind this person or all beings that dedicate their merit of this spiritual practice of this meditation to this person, these people, may they be well, may they be happy, may they be free from suffering. May they have every abundance, every support, every auspicious blessing in their life. Okay, so you've been sitting here for an hour and a half now. So I'd like to give you the opportunity to stand up and stretch your legs if you'd like to. And then, uh, if anyone needs a bathroom, can I just ask who feels more peaceful than I did an hour and a half ago? Very good. See, so these temporary liberations, you do have capacity to experience peace. It's a matter of applying oneself correctly. Confidence in the method, confidence in your ability, and in the consistency.